Chapter 3, Mayfield Creek. But I thought we'd keep going, said Patsy, and not stop till we got to New Orleans. Mama laughed. Nobody said anything like that. And here, all we did was to cross the river over to Kentucky. The girl went on. You never can tell what you'll do on the river, said Mama. That's why Daddy likes it so much. <clears throat> it's a free life. He can do what he pleases. He's his own boss. If he wants to go, he goes. If he wants to stay, he stays. But if he likes the river so much, why doesn't he stay on it? asked Patsy. Stop fussing, said Mama. There's good fishing here, and we're staying until Daddy feels like moving on. Oh, I just want to see New Orleans. So bad, cried Patsy. Go and feed your chickens, said Mama. A month had passed, and the Fosters were still at Mayfield Creek. It was a pleasant location in the chute between Island No. 1 and Cane Island, with a sloping river bank and trees for shade. They lived in the houseboat, fished up and down the river, and peddled the fish in nearby towns. Daddy had rented a second-hand Ford to drive around in. We might as well have stayed at River City, said Patsy. Daddy fished and sold fish there. He had his own little fish house, and all the people in town came to buy from him. There were three other fish houses in River City, said Mama. Daddy had too much competition. Fish, fish, fish. The Foster's whole life was nothing but fish. Sometimes Patsy wished she had never seen one. She never ate fish, and she hated the constant fishy smell. One morning, Mama was washing clothes on the river bank. Daddy had strung the wire clothesline up between two trees. When Mama began to hang the clothes up, she looked at the sky. I hope it won't rain, she said. Bring the clothespins here, Patsy. Patsy heard voices and looked up. Mama, she said, somebody's coming to see us. A woman came down the river bank. She held two children by the hand, a boy of eight and a girl of ten. Howdy, how you folks doing, she called out. Miss Foster said politely, good morning. I'm Ms. Preston, the woman said. I live in that two-story house up there on the road. Glad to meet you, said Miss Foster. She hung up the last pair of overalls and came over. Come in and sat down. To Patsy, she said, go get the clothes props and prop up the line. The woman followed but stopped at the stage plank. I seen your shack down here, she began. My what? asked Miss Foster. Your shack, repeated Miss Preston. Oh well, what do you call it then? I call it a houseboat, said Miss Foster. Patsy came up and stared at the newcomers. She had seen the children up by their house, but had never spoken to them. They were nicely dressed and had socks and shoes on. Their hair was all slicked back. They stared back at her mom and at her in return. On the Ohio River, it's called a shanty boat, explained Miss Foster. But in Louisiana and Arkansas, it's a houseboat. Do you live on it? asked Miss Preston. We sure do, said Miss Foster. Come on in. The stage plank will hold you. Come on in and sit down. The women and children stepped across the plank warily. Aren't you afraid your kids will get drowned? Miss Preston asked. They're too mean for that, Miss Foster laughed. Patsy spoke up. We are not either mean. Well, Patsy is okay, Miss Foster admitted. Tom the cat was rubbing against her, her skirts. But between her and the cat, I don't know which one is meanest. Don't she ever fall in, asked the woman. Laws, yes, said Miss Foster. Patsy's my unluckiest one. She's always fallen in the river. I never let my two go near it, said Miss Preston. I don't trust that old river as far as I can see it. She held her children firmly by the hand. 
Patsy looked at them in disgust. They were worse babies than Bunny and Dan. There would be no fun playing with them. Miss Foster laughed. She and Miss Preston sat down on the leather couch. Fallen in is an old story with us, Miss Foster went on. That's why I'm getting gray hairs. Millie, she's my oldest, learned how to swim at Memphis when she was four. She'd fall in, and I'd tell her to get herself out, and sure enough, she would. Good thing she learned young, because she's had to haul all the others out. I don't worry if Millie's with them. You don't go off and leave them alone in this shack, I mean, on this shanty boat, do you? Sure, said Miss Foster. Abe and I go peddling fish twice a week. That's the way we make a living. Millie stays here and takes care of the kids. How old is Millie? She's 12, going on 13, said Miss Foster. But she acts like she's 20, added Patsy. Patsy here is a real river rat. Miss Foster went on. She was born right in the middle of the Mississippi River. That was when we were at Nonkuna Creek down below Memphis. That houseboat we had then was so small I called it the Cracker Box. All but two years of Patsy li Patsy's life has been spent on the river. That girl never lived in town in her life until we went to River City, Illinois. Miss Preston and her children looked at Patsy as if she were some kind of queer fish. How terrible, said Miss Preston. One time she fell in and went under the barge and her daddy had to drag her out by the legs, said Miss Foster. That time she spit enough water you'd have thought she was a camel. The woman laughed. I can dog paddle now, said Patsy. Every day I go in the water and try it. I'm going to keep trying until I learn how to swim. Oh, you'll learn all right, said Mama. All my kids are real fish when it comes to water. They've never been scared of the river. You folks want any milk, asked, asked Miss Preston. With two cows, we got more than we need. I got plenty to sell. Milk, asked Miss Foster. No thanks, we don't need any. My kids don't like it. They haven't lived on land long enough to get to like it, I reckon. She took her visitor into the houseboat to look it over. Well, I never, said Miss Preston, when they came out on the porch again. You've got it better than I have with bottled gas and everything. It's our home, said Miss Foster. I try to have it nice. Of course, we don't have hook up our... We don't hook up our electric lights unless we're staying a long time. The sky began to cloud over, so Miss Preston took her children and hurried home, afraid of rain. I hope my clothes will get dry, said Miss Foster. After the woman left, Patsy thought of the River City house and the neighbors there. I wonder how pushcart Aggie's parakeets are, said Patsy. I bet if I'd asked her for it, she'd have given me one. A parakeet would make a nice pet for a houseboat. Yes, if the cat didn't eat it, said Mama. Remember the Millers and the time Janie found a pearl, asked Patsy. It takes more than a pearl to make a mussel fisherman rich, said Mama. Patsy thought of the Kramer girls and Jenny and Laura and felt quite homesick. When we going back to River City, Mama, she asked. I don't know, said Mama, ask your daddy. Just then the John boat came round the end of the fish barge. Come on, Patsy, called Millie. You going with us. Patsy ran and jumped in the boat, and Daddy started the outboard motor. They were headed down river to get shrimp for bait. It's fixin' to rain, called Mama. Don't you think you'd better wait and go later? But her words were lost on the wind. The motor roared loudly, and off they went. Soon they came to a sandy bank and got out. The two girls walked down the bank, pulling the scene net. They scooped up the river shrimp and dumped them in the bait bucket. But Mama was right. It began to rain, and the wind turned into a gale. 
So Daddy called them back to the John boat. Storm coming, he shouted, let's go home. The girls dropped everything and ran. Chug, 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 started the motor. Then it slowed up and died. Daddy fussed with it, but it would not start again. He took the oars and began rowing. It began to pour. Daddy pulled and pulled, trying to get the John boat around, around a fallen tree in the river. But every time the wind came, the waves jumped over the boat. Oh, Daddy, we're getting soaked, cried Patsy. A little rain won't hurt you, Daddy laughed. At last, the boat got out in the river, and Daddy kept on rowing. When they came to the chute, it was windy there, too. The wind had blown the clothesline down, and Mama was out picking the clothes up from the mud. Patsy, she called, you never propped the clothesline up the way I told you. The girls helped pick up the wet clothes and made a dash for the houseboat. Bunny and Dan were hugging the porch post to keep from being blown off. Shut the door, shut the door, cried Patsy, pushing everybody in. Oh, this wind, cried Mama. It's trying to blow all the furniture through the house and out the back door. They all changed to, to dry clothes. Daddy moved the houseboat farther down the chute out of the wind. Soon the storm was over. The wind and rain stopped as suddenly as it had begun, and the sun came out. So Daddy and Patsy went back to the same place. They found the bait bucket washed into the bank. Full of mud and water, and the sign caught on a log. This time, they got a good supply of shrimp. Then Daddy saw some crows ahead on the sandy bank. There, after turtle eggs, he said, chasing them away. Shoo, I can use those eggs myself. He found a circular hole on the bank, poked a stick in six or eight inches, and uncovered 24 turtle eggs. They were round as marbles and had soft shells. Are they good to eat? asked Patsy. Sure, said Daddy. They are better to eat than the turtle meat. We are lucky to get these before the crows did. Back at the houseboat, Daddy boiled the eggs and punched a hole in each to let the white run out like jelly. The yolk was cooked hard, but the white stayed liquid like milk. He baited hooks with the eggs, shells and all, as far as they went, then used shrimp. Baiting his hooks meant an hour and a half of work for Daddy. He sat on the edge of the fish barge and worked steadily and quietly. He had three trot lines, each in a square line box. Each line had from 80 to 100 short cords with hooks attached. He had to put bait on every hook. All the cords had to be carefully placed so they would not get tangled. Tom the cat came sniffing up. Look here, said Daddy. These shrimp are for the fish, not for you. Patsy gave Tom a dish of soup of shrimp all for himself. Then she fed her chickens and watered them. As soon as the hooks were baited, Daddy got ready to go out and set his lines. He put his knee boots on and took a can of gasoline to the John boat. He put the line boxes in the boat. He dried the motor off and got it started. Hey, Patsy, he called. You going with me? Patsy came running and jumped in beside him. They chugged up river a half mile or so. Then Daddy turned the oars over to Patsy while he set the lines. Patsy liked going out alone with Daddy. He treated her as if she were grown up. He didn't boss her the way Millie did. It was always quiet and peaceful out on the river alone with Daddy. He didn't talk much, and neither did she, but they understood each other. Each fish line had a heavy weight on one end to sink it in the water. Daddy threw out the other end, with a double can buoy attached. The buoy floated on the waves and showed him the location of the line the next day. When the line was in place, all the short cords with the baited hooks hung down in the water to snag the fish. 
On their way back, Daddy stopped by a log that was sticking out of the water. Patsy picked up three mud turtles and tossed them into the boat. More pets, Daddy laughed. I can't ever get enough, said Patsy. Early the next morning, before breakfast, Patsy went out again to help Daddy run the lines and bring the fish in. He caught some big ones this time. One weighed 18 pounds and one 15. He took them and those already in the fish box and packed them in the tub of ice in the trunk of the old car. Mama was all dressed up in her good clothes, ready to go to town. Daddy hurried to change. Can't I go with you, begged Patsy. No, said Mama, you stay here. You kids are okay here. But Mama, said Patsy, I want to go along. I want to help sell fish. We don't need you, said Mama. You going to leave us all alone here, Mama asked Patsy. You won't be alone, said Mama. Millie will be here. Millie's so bossy, said Patsy. She won't let me do a thing. I want to. She won't let me go out in the john boat or anything. Well, you can't swim, said Mama. I'd worry myself to death if Millie wasn't here to pull you kids out. She can boss Dan and Bunny all she wants to, said Patsy. They're just babies. I've got more sense than they've got. You listen to what Millie tells you, said Mama. She knows how to cook and use the gas stove. You mind what she says, and you won't get in any trouble. When will you be back? asked Patsy. It'll be three o'clock if we don't stop for groceries, said Mama. If we do, we won't be home till five. The fish markets are flooded now and won't buy fish. Daddy's got so many this time, we'll have to peddle them at people's houses till we sell them all. Patsy looked sad as she watched the old Ford go up the river, bank and away. The day would be endless until five o'clock. The houseboat was not like home with Mama away. She thought of her old Illinois friends, Jenny Cobb and the Kramer girls, and the thought made her homesick. There were no children on Mayfield Creek except the Preston boy and girl who were not allowed to play by the river. Beyond the Preston house was a country store where a cranky old man named Stubb Henderson sold groceries, but he had no family. There was no one around but Bossy Millie. Dan and Bunny had their toys on the back porch and played there all morning long. Patsy took her turtles out of the fish box and lined them up on deck. She had twelve now. She pretended they were pupils in school, and she was the teacher. Each time one moved out of his seat, she took her stick and made it go back. She tried to think up tricks, but the turtles did not respond. They were stupid, so she put them back in the fish box. She decided to catch skipjacks for bait. Skipjacks were fish that barely hit the water. They flipped and jumped in a school of minnows, trying to catch them. Patsy got her pole and sat on the guard. The pole had a wire line with a grab hook. Three hooks welded together. She began snagging the skip jacks. She had 14 in her pail when Dan came out. In trying to go past her on the guard, he kicked the pail over. Now look what you've done, cried Patsy, spilled on my skip jacks. Dan ran round the guard and Patsy chased him. She caught him and ducked his head in a tub of wash water that was standing on the back porch. Then Dan took a dipper and began throwing water in her face. Patsy backed up then, splash, back she fell into the river. Just what Mama said she thought, I'm always falling in. She bobbled about trying to save herself, if I could only swim. That's what Mama's been saying all along. I've got to learn how, but I don't know how to swim. That means I'm going to go down three times and drown. She swallowed some water and began to choke. She thrashed her arms about wildly. Where's Millie? Why doesn't Millie come? She's supposed to haul all the little kids out, Mama said. 
Mama won't worry if Millie stays home with us. Patsy felt herself going down, but she didn't go down at all. Somebody had hold of her arm. Somebody was pushing and shoving her. She reached up and got hold of the guard. A man's voice said, I've got her, and she was lifted up on deck. Now they turned her over and started pumping water out of her. She wished they would stop. At last they did, and she was able to rest and get her breath back. Then she opened her eyes. There was Millie with frightened face. Kneeling beside her, there was Stub Henderson, the cranky old storekeeper, staring down at her, and over on the leather couch, Bunny and Dan were holding each other and crying their eyes out. You're gonna learn to swim, young lady, said Stub. He sounded very cross. I'm gonna learn you, mu you myself before this day is over. When Patsy got up, she looked at Stub Henderson and said, What you doing here? I was fishing in my john boat when I heard a big splash. Stub said, I came over to get the biggest fish of all, and it was you. Melly laughed, but Patsy did not think his joke was funny at all. She was worried about only one thing. Promise me you won't tell Mama and Daddy, she begged. Stub promised on condition that Patsy would learn how to swim. Come on now, he said. No time like the present. I'm tired, said Patsy. I nearly got drowned just now. But Stub would not listen to excuses. Come on, I'll show you. I know how to dog paddle, said Patsy. All Dan and Bunny can do is mud crawl. Reluctantly, she put on her bathing suit. Dog paddling is not swimming, said Stub. He meant business, so he anchored his boat out in the river, where the water was over Patsy's head. He showed her how to do the side stroke and told her to swim out to him, and he would catch her. Patsy was very scared, but she jumped in and tried it. Come on, called Stubb, keep coming. Patsy tried to make the strokes the way Stubb told her, and was surprised when she reached Stubb's boat. Stubb moved it farther out, and she tried again. He gave her several pointers, and she tried to do it right. You're swimming, kid, you're swimming, shouted Stubb. Patsy swam back and forth several times. Dan and Bunny clapped their hands, and even Millie was pleased. Now I won't have to pull you out any more, said Stubb. As he paddled away in his boat, Patsy kept on practicing after he left. Then she got tired, so she climbed up on the deck to rest. From now on, said Millie, if you fall in, you can get yourself out. When Mama and Daddy got back at five o'clock, the children were excited over the news they had to tell. Patsy can swim, Patsy can swim, they cried. They told how Stubb Henderson came and gave her lessons. At first, Mama would not believe it. Then she said, it's about time you learned. Now I'll stop worrying about you falling in. It'll be little Abe's turn to learn next. The very next Saturday, Patsy got her longed-for trip to town. Daddy slipped on the fish barge and sprained his ankle, so he decided not to go. Mama took Patsy with her. It was a hot summer day. They drove through corn and tobacco fields. The tobacco was only a foot high and had not begun to sucker yet. The corn was getting tall and roasting ears were setting on. They passed orchards of fruit, trees, and soon came to Barlow, a small town. Main Street was lined with booths and peddlers in cars. It was a busy place with people coming and going. Country people had brought vegetables, chickens, eggs, corn, and other produce to sell. Town people came to buy. Miss Foster and Patsy sat in the Ford and waited for customers. When one came, Mon Mom Mama got out and sold fish. Buying was brisk for a while, then it slackened. We'll have to go on to Cavill said Mama, discouraged. Daddy's better at selling than I am. Then she saw a familiar figure coming down the street. There comes Mr. Cooper. He's been buying from us every week. Maybe he'll help us out. Mr. Cooper owned the restaurant down at the corner. So this is the houseboat girl, he exclaimed, patting Patsy on her back. Got any fresh fish today, Miss Foster? He looked the fish over and said he would take all that were left in the tub. While Miss Foster was weighing up, a stray cat came along and sniffed at the fish. Patsy picked it up. 
Put that cat down, Patsy, said Mama. Don't start messing with a strange alley cat. The restaurant man looked at Patsy again. Is this the girl that likes pets so much? He asked. It sure is, said Mama. She just can't let him alone. Mr. Cooper said, You don't want a cat, girl. I'll give you a dog. Patsy gasped. You will, she said. This was too good to be true. She dropped the cat hastily. Come with me, said Mr. Cooper. Miss Foster laughed. You are just fooling. We don't need a dog. But Patsy was on her way to the restaurant. When she came back, she led a short-haired, half-grown black dog on a rope. Mr. Cooper came back, too. We can't take a dog with us, said Miss Foster. Our houseboat's crowded already. Mr. Cooper laughed. What's a houseboat without a dog? They all looked at the dog, whose name was Blackie, except for his white breast. He's the blackest dog I ever saw, said Mr. Cooper. His hair is so shiny it glitters. That dog's not scared of a thing. He's part hound and part just plain cur. Take him along with you, Patsy. I know you'll give him a good home. Patsy could not find words to thank Mr. Cooper. When she and Mama got home, the children crowded round and patted Blackie on the head. Blackie wagged his tail, happy to have found good friends. Daddy said he looked like a mighty fine dog, but Mama kept on, kept on shaking her head. I've got enough kids without taking on a bunch of pets, she said. Chapter 4 On the River Again We are going on the river again, cried Dan. We are, asked Patsy. She could hardly believe it. There was brisk excitement in the air. Daddy was getting his motors tuned up and was putting things in order on the fish barge. Mama had done a good house cleaning in the houseboat and a big family washing on the riverbank. While Daddy was baiting his lines for the last time, Mama got supper ready. Only Millie did not want to go. We can't go yet, she said. Our order hasn't come. I haven't a decent dress to wear to town. Three weeks before, Mama and Millie had sent an order to a mail order house for a dress for Millie and some sewing supplies. Every day, Millie went to the Wycliffe post office, but no package had come. The postmaster said he would forward it, said Mama. I told him we would stop at Columbus. That means we'll never get it, said Millie. I can't help it, said Mama. Daddy's set to go. Patsy shinnied up the monkey pole to the roof of the houseboat. Millie was already there, tying down fishing gear and nets. They saw Daddy go off round the bend of the chute. What's he setting his lines tonight for, asked Patsy. To get a big haul of fish, said Millie. Are we talking, taking smelly old fish with us, asked Patsy. Do we have to wait till Daddy runs his lines in the morning? I thought we were starting early. Daddy will bring them in by daylight, said Millie. At supper, Mama said, well, stop at Columbus, Kentucky to sell our fish. That'll give us a little cash money to go on. Daddy's got a Kentucky fishing license, so we'll stop wherever we can in Kentucky and fish along the way. But if we are going somewhere, why can't we just hurry up and get there, asked Patsy. I just want to get to New Orleans so bad. On the river, nobody likes to hurry, said Daddy, who had just come in. That's the good thing about it. Patsy hardly took time to eat. She left the table and went out on the riverbank to close up her chicken coop. It was dark now, and the hens were inside. Dan helped her carry the coop to the cabin boat. Patsy called Blackie the dog and told him they were leaving the next day. Blackie wagged his tail. It was all right with him. That night, everybody went to bed early. The next morning, when Mama called the children to get up, Daddy was back with the fish, about 30 pounds. They ate breakfast by the light of the kerosene lamp. The houseboat was out in the river by the time the sun was up. There was no one to wave to, no one to call goodbye. It made Patsy think of the time they had left 
River City. There was nothing permanent about river life. People on the river were always coming and going, here today and gone tomorrow, as Daddy said. That big old river was always calling you to leave the river bank and go places, and nobody cared if you went or stayed. This time, there were no close friends being left behind. Patsy could not mourn the loss of the Preston children, who had never come to play by the river, and whom she knew only by sight. Patsy sat on the front deck with Blackie and looked ahead. It was good to be on the river again. Life in Mayfield Creek had become dull and monotonous. On the river, there was always something new to see. The river was full of bends. The houseboat was always turning corners and coming out on a new stretch. Every bend brought a new landscape, and often there were boats and barges to be seen. Patsy could not see much of the towns. They were too far back. Some were hidden behind the levees, and she never knew they were there at all unless she looked at the map. Sometimes she watched the buoys and navigation lights that marked the channel. The current of the Mississippi was unpredictable. The channel never seemed to follow the course of the stream itself. It wiggled around between the banks, often moving from one side to the other in a crossing. In low water, the, crossing, the crossings were well marked with buoys. Wherever the channel crossed the river, there was a river light or a day mark on the opposite bank. From each light or mark, the pilot set his course on the next one. One mark picked him up and called him, then sent him on to the next. There are so many lights and buoys on the river, said Daddy. Any fool can keep in the channel. The lights were oil lamps set on tripod posts 12 feet high with a ladder to reach up. They burned round the clock with a flame so small it hardly showed by day, but was magnified by the globe at night. They burned kerosene and were tended every fourth day by a lamp lighter. In the middle of the morning, Patsy saw a ferry boat crossing the river ahead. She called Dan and told him, Is this a town we are coming to? asked Dan. Patsy looked at the map. Mama had taken map number three out of the river map book and tacked it up on the wall. It's Columbus, Kentucky, cried Patsy. We are there already. Boy, don't I wish I could have a ride on that ferry boat. She and Dan and Bunny waved to the people on the ferry. Daddy nosed the houseboat in on the Missouri side below the ferry landing and tied up under some willows. Mama had dinner ready and and as soon as Daddy washed up, they ate. Across the river on the Kentucky side, they could see the high bluffs called the Iron Banks. Daddy said they were the highest bluffs between Cairo, Cairo and Memphis. There was a muddy bar below them. Can we go to town? Can we go to town? cried the children. Mama and Daddy got ready to take the fish to Columbus. Mama said Patsy and Dan could go, so they quickly washed and put on their good clothes. Millie offered to stay on the houseboat and keep Bunny if Mama would stop at the post office for the mail order package. Bunny cried when they left, so they promised to bring her candy. They crossed the river in the John boat and went to the fish market of Jim Tom Shaney, who bought all they had. Hearing a band playing, Mama and the children went off downtown, leaving Daddy at Jim Tom's. Several hours later, they came back and found Daddy very impatient. I want to set my lines tonight, he scolded. But Daddy, cried Patsy, guess where we went. They had a circus, and we went to it, said Dan. A circus? What next? The children were so happy, Daddy had to cheer up. All the way across the river, they talked about the acrobats they had seen. When they reached the houseboat, they told Millie and Bunny about it. They gave Bunny the candy they had brought for her. Millie asked about the mail order package, but Mama shook her head. There was nothing at the post office. As soon as Patsy changed into her shorts, she started skinning the cat from the overhead porch beam. You'll be breaking your neck now for sure, said Mama. 
The next morning, Daddy got up early to run his lines. Before breakfast, he had taken his fish catch over to Jim, Jim Tom Cheney. Now, he had a little more change in his pocket. By the time the children had eaten their breakfast, the houseboat had resumed its voyage downriver. <clears throat> As Patsy dried the dishes, she looked out the window. It was like a moving picture, she, sh she thought. Something different every minute as the banks started marching past. Each time she picked up a dish and looked at again. The scene had changed. The river made so many turns she was never sure whether she was looking at Kentucky or Missouri. Sometimes the sun shone in the windows over the sink and a little later it would be coming in through the windows opposite as if it were afternoon. That was because the river was flowing north. Millie got out the big, fat mail-order catalog and spent a long time looking at it. <clears throat> Mama had brought out her box of quilt patches and was cutting new ones. I hope my new dress comes soon, Millie said to Mama. Uh, the dresses I get from the catalog fit me better than those bought in the stores. The stores in these little old river towns are no good anyhow. My old dresses are all too small. I'll give them to Patsy. I don't want your hand-me-downs, said Patsy. Don't be too choosy, honey, said Mama. Better be glad to get them. We've got to look on the map and see each town we're coming to, and go to the post office when we get there, said Millie. Did you order me a new dress, Mama? asked Patsy. No, said Mama. Shorts and t-shirts are, are good enough on the river. Nobody looks at river kids anyhow. You can wear Millie's old ones to town. Millie happened to look up and see some pilings go past the window. Where's Daddy going? She asked. Is he fixin' to tie up? She ran out quickly. Pile dikes were wide spaced fences of heavy posts called piling, driven out in the river. They were used by the U.S. Army engineers to control the river's course. In some places, they lined the banks like the teeth of a comb. They could be dangerous for a small boat, pushed against them by a stiff current, but Daddy sometimes tied his big outfit to them for a short stop. The water was slapping up against the hull. A lively current was passing on the chute side. What's Daddy going over to the pilings for? asked Patsy. Daddy knows what he's doing, said Mama. He's in the channel. He's going by the channel marks. He's lived on the river long enough to. But that time, Abe Foster made a mistake. Suddenly, there was a terrible jolt, followed by a long, drawn-out grating and grinding. The mail-order catalog was knocked off the table and dishes were thrown out of the cupboards. Mama nearly fell off her chair, and Patsy landed plunk on the floor with a broken plate in her hand. Bunny came staggering in with a bump on her head. Dan began to scream. A sandbar, Millie shouted from the front porch. We are on a sandbar. Nobody needed to tell Daddy or Mama either. Even the children knew it, down to little Bunny. They all went out to see. Daddy was furious. This crazy old river, he scolded, a sandbar in the middle, right in the channel. How can a fellow keep from hitting it? He came up to the porch in his John boat. It's the cabin boat that stuck, not the houseboat. The mishap meant a long delay, but Daddy knew just what to do. He took the outboard John boat and pulled the houseboat down to a towhead, leaving Patsy and the little ones alone on board. Then he brought Mama and Millie back to help him get the cabin boat off the sand. You'll have to wade out and push, Daddy said. Wade and push, gasped Mama, much as she loved the river. Mama's love was purely an external one. She could not swim, and she never ventured into the river if she could help it. To her, wading in the river was a terrible thing. 
now faced with the necess necessity <clears throat> of putting her feet in it, she was so scared she began to shake all over. But Millie had taken off her shoes and plunged in, so Mama had to, had to do the same. First, Daddy tried pushing with the oars, using main strength, but the sand was crawly and worked right out from under the paddle. Let Lamy, I can see all the fish in the river, Mama smote, spoke in a low voice, so Millie would not hear. Mama and I will push, Millie told Daddy. When you start the motor to back it up, we'll both push. Mama waded over, but Daddy will run us over, she cried. Don't be silly, Mama, <clears throat> said Millie. He's going to back, I said. The motor roared as Mama pushed and Millie pushed, but the boat, a heavy one, 27 feet long and 10 feet wide, did not budge. <clears throat> After repeated trials, it was still in the same place. At the stern of the boat were two heavy barrels of gasoline. Daddy decided to move these to the bow. He also filled an empty fish tub with water. With this additional weight on the bow, he hoped to raise the stern and get the rudder off the sand. After this, they tried again. He started the motor, and with more pushing, the cabin boat finally slid back off the sandbar into deeper water. You wait here now, Mama, said Millie, till I ring the john boat. Mama stood in the middle of the river with water all around her, petrified with fear. While she was waiting for the john boat to come, she happened to look down. To her great surprise, she saw that the water was not even ankle deep, and when she returned to the houseboat, the bottom of her dress was not even wet. Safely back in her cozy kitchen again, Mama laughed and laughed. I thought I was drowned for sure, she said. I could just feel all those fishes nibbling at my toes. Up spoke Dan. I bet you wished Stubb Henderson would come and pull you out the way he did Patsy. Stubb, Patsy, cried Mama, surprised. When did Stubb pull Patsy out? Patsy out. Did Patsy fall in and nobody tell me? Millie and Patsy glared at Dan. Patsy grabbed his arm and started to shake him, but the secret was out. Oh gosh, said Dan, I wasn't supposed to tell. I forgot. Oh well, said Patsy, she's got to know some time. So the whole story came out. Patsy's tumble in the creek, which led to her swimming lesson from old cranky Stubb. Why didn't Stubb tell me, asked Mama. I made him promise not to, said Patsy. Well, since it's all over, said Mama, I'm glad you can swim and won't have to be pulled out again. Patsy put her arm around her mother's waist, looked up at her and said, Want me to teach you how to swim, Mama? No, cried Mama, there are too many fish in the river. The children laughed. The Fosters did not start on until the next day, and then they did not get far. The wind kept blowing the boat upriver and was so strong that Daddy decided to lay over. He tied up in the chute nearby out of the wind because the boat was too hard to handle. That afternoon, there was a storm. It rained hard and kept them all indoors. After the storm, Millie and Patsy went exploring in the john boat. They had not gone far before they saw a lamplighter's boat tied near a bank that had caved in. The tripod of the river light had fallen down and the lamplighter was hanging the lamp on a tree. When he came back to his boat, he called to the girls. You girls from the shanty boat over there. Yes, we are, said Millie. Are you in trouble? The man asked. Can I tow you anywhere? We are okay now. You're a day late. Millie told him about getting stuck on the sand bar, and he laughed. Where are you folks going? asked the lamplighter. Oh, just down river, said Millie. We stop wherever Daddy takes a notion to stop. Real river people, eh? asked the man. 
Sure, said Millie. My sister here was born in the middle of the Mississippi River. Oh, Millie, cried Patsy, don't tell everybody that. The man laughed. Ever since the days of the flatboats, there have been all kinds of people going down river, hunting, adventure, said the lamplighter. Nowadays, some of them get more than they bargained for. Most every day, I meet up with them and try to help them if I can. They come sailing down in any old kind of craft, in a rubber canoe or a million dollar yacht or a big shanty boat outfit like yours. You're lucky if your daddy knows what he's doing. He's a real river man, said Miley with dignity. He's lived on the river all his life, added Patsy. Okay then, said the lamplighter, waving his hand as he started off. Have a good trip. When the girls got back to the houseboat, they told Mama and Daddy about the lamplighter. That couldn't have been Seth Barker, could it? asked Mama. No, said Daddy. He's not as far north as this. His run is down along Arkansas. Wonder if we'll see Seth and Eddie this trip, said Mama. I doubt it, said Daddy. They never stay in one place very long. They're as bad as you, Abe, said Mama. Well, said Daddy laughing, the river keeps moving. Why shouldn't I? Patsy studied the river map each day. Each new page was tacked to the wall and showed a new stretch of the river. All lights and buoys were clearly marked. If I could only teach Daddy to read, said Patsy. What's the good of a map, asked Daddy. The channel has changed a dozen times since it's been printed. Well, it's fun to look at anyhow, said Patsy. What's the next town we're coming to, asked Bunny. Town meant candy to Bunny, so she could not get there too soon. Hickman, Kentucky, said Patsy. I'll watch all the lights and tell you when we are getting near. 939, that's William's light, and 937.3 is Samuel light. Hickman is right by island number 6. The day wore slowly on. There were long stretches of revet revetments, first on the Missouri, then on the Kentucky side. Revetments were banks paved with asphalt to prevent erosion, where the current raced swiftly by. They made progress difficult because there was always danger that the houseboat might be smashed against them. Sometime later, Patsy looked up from the mail order catalog and saw a light, 927.5. That's Henderson light. Why, we never stopped at Hickman at all. We are past it. We are past Hickman, cried Millie in dismay. She slumped in a chair and began to grumble. I wanted to go to the post office for my package. It's too late now, said Mama. Coming down river, it's hard to get in and out of Hickman Bend. But we should have seen the town. It's a pretty place, high up on a hill, and there's a ferry, too. Looks like Daddy's aiming to make New Madrid tonight. Why, that's way over on the next page, said Patsy, looking at the map book. Well, go by a big island first, number eight. That's still in Kentucky, but pretty soon we'll get to Tennessee. She returned the page. She turned the page. Below island number eight, there were great sandbars for miles along the river and stretching inland, dotted with snags and fallen trees from previous floods. Tall grasses and willows grew on the higher parts. There were many birds, kingfishers, seagulls, kildees, and a few pelicans. Mama came over to look at the map, and Patsy started explaining. When we get to the Kentucky-Tennessee line, there's a big loop in the river. New Madrid's up at the top of, in Missouri. The loop is in Kentucky. That's New Madrid Bend, said Mama. Daddy says you can walk across that neck of land in 30 minutes, but it takes half a day to go around in a boat. The neck is only a mile wide, but it's 19 miles around the loop, almost a circle. Too bad we can't carry the houseboat over, said Dan. Then we wouldn't get to stop at New Madrid, said Patsy. 
Now they were traveling northeast as if heading for Illinois again. It was a long, hard pull to New Madrid, and Mama thought they'd never make it. The wind was against them all the time, blowing them the other way, so it took twice as much gas to push the boat. Late in the day, they came in sight of New Madrid, and Daddy made the houseboat fast to some piling near the landing. I'm about out of food, said Mama. I'll have to lay in a supply for two or three days. If we should get laid up in a storm, we'd have to eat. I'll have to fill up with gas, too, said Daddy. I want to go to the post office, said Millie. We want candy, said Dan and Bunny. Patsy thought for a minute, and I'd like to get a great big bunch of bananas, she said. They all laughed.